Um, so the rest of the cells that you're going to be observing throughout the lab are eukaryotic cells. So the first eukaryotic cell that you're going to look at is a plant eukaryotic cell. This is Elodia, or sometimes pr pronounced Elodia. Now, Elodia are plant cells. Um, they're, they're larger than the prokaryotic cells that we just observed, and we can definitely see some membrane-bound organelles. So for example, we can see the nucleus. Again, remember that all cells are going to have DNA or genetic material. Um, in this eukaryotic plant cell, that genetic material is housed within the nucleus. In addition, you see these smaller circles, these green circles. These are a type of plastid, an organelle um, that's responsible for making or storing carbohydrates. These are chloroplasts. These are where photosynthesis, um, the process of photosynthesis actually occurs in eukaryotic plant cells. So again, remember, oscillatoria was photosynthetic. It did not have these membrane-bound uh, organelles called chloroplasts. Here now we're looking at a photosynthetic plant cell and we can clearly see those little chloroplasts. In addition to the chloroplasts, you can see that um, the cells have a sort of uniform shape and, and oftentimes it's described as almost rectangular. That rectangular shape is because of the plant cells um, sort of rigid cell wall. Um, within the cell wall, you would have a, the plant would have a plasma membrane, but what gives it its sort of uniform shape is that cell wall. Now, interesting and interestingly enough, um, oftentimes if we look at Elodia and it's fresh and it's alive, um, one of the things that students can actually observe is that the chloroplasts will seem to be sort of moving in a circular motion right inside of the cell wall. Um, that process that they're watching is actually called cytoplasmic streaming. And what happens is, and we're going to talk about this in just a second, each of these cells is going to be connected to one another through little openings called plasmodesmata. So as we see sort of the cytoplasm moving, we excuse me, as the cytoplasm moves from one cell to the other, as materials shift from one cell to the other, it actually causes sort of a movement of the organelles within the cell. Now that movement can be affected by things like light and temperature and pH. Now, how, what are these little openings that are in between the cells that I just mentioned? Again, th those were called plasmodesmata. In procedure 3.4, we're going to have you look at these plasmodesmata. Again, one of the things to understand is that when things live, when, when organisms are multicellular and they're made up of millions or billions of cells, the cells still have to sort of be able to communicate with one another in order for the organism as a whole to maintain homeostasis. So in order to do that, they, they're going to communicate with one another chemically. And this is often done by materials moving from one cell to another. Now that movement is orchestrated through these openings in the cell wall called plasmodesmata. And ultimately, What's going to happen is, is as cytoplasm moves, it carries those signaling or those communication molecules from one cell to the next. It can also share nutrients or other other materials in the cytoplasm can move from one cell to the other. And, and ultimately, these plasma does, this is a nice picture that um, we obviously were able to to use to kind of blow this up and show students what those openings look like in lab when you actually look at a um, a prepared slide we see the plasmodesmata as sort of these darker striations or these darker lines between that thick cell wall. So for example, here you can imagine that you'd have that plasmodesmata and you'd have materials sort of flowing from one plant cell to another. Again, in our picture here, it's a little bit clearer, but it should be pointed out that the plasma, plasmodesmata are always open. And so ultimately materials can always sort of be flowing from one plant cell to the next. Now, in procedures 3.5 and 3.6, we again are going to be observing eukaryotic cells and we're going to be observing eukaryotic plant cells. So we have lots of examples of eukaryotic plant cells. What we're going to observe in 3.5 is 
onion, onion cells. And so remember that onions grow under the ground, right? They're, the, they're sort of the, the bulb. They're, they are grown in the, in the absence of sunlight. Um, and so they're not photosynthesizing, right? So they're underneath. So when we look at the onion, again, one of the things to be thinking about is we really wouldn't expect to see chloroplasts because they don't have access to light. Okay. They're not the photosynthetic material of an onion plant that, you know, resides above the ground in regards to the leaves, for example. But when we look at the onion, one of the things that you're going to be doing, this is a slide that you will be making, is you will be staining that with a stain called neutral red. And I just want to quickly point your attention between the unstained versus the stained and notice the contrast and, and sort of the, the structures that pop out with the, with the stain. So do note that sort of the structure that we want you to be able to identify on the onion. You can see that the nucleus stains very vividly. Again, remember that in the nucleus, we expect to find that genetic material. We expect to find DNA. And then again, you can see that rigid cell wall. Also note again, right, that there aren't chloroplasts and be able to explain why we don't expect to see chloroplasts here in the onion bulb. In 3.6, you're also going to be looking at more eukaryotic plant cells. In this case, you're going to be looking at the potato and potato cells. You are, again, going to stain these. The stain that you're going to use for the potato cells is iodine. Iodine in the presence of starch is going to turn purple. So one of the things that you can see when we're looking at our potato slide here, and again, this is going to be a wet mount. This is going to, going to be a slide that you see. Remember that potatoes are growing under the ground. So they're growing in the soil. Again, there's an absence of sunlight. So the potatoes are not that's not the photosynthetic part of the plant. The photosynthetic part of the plant is going to be above ground. So we wouldn't expect to find chloroplast. And when we look here, again, it should be fairly apparent that there are no chloroplasts there. But we see these little purple structures. Um, again, those purple structures are a special type of plastid called an amnioplast. Remember, plastids are special organelles that ultimately are going to store um, things like carbohydrates, right? So we talked about the chloroplast is a plastid, amnioplasts are a plastid. Um, these amnioplasts are going to start, store large amounts of starch. So the potato, okay, is really an, is primarily the energy storage part of the plant. And you can see that there are lots and lots of these little amnioplasts within each of the cells. You can sort of see each sort of separation of cell by sort of this kind of this translucent line. This would be the plant's cell wall. So again, keep in mind that with each of the slides that you're making, um, you need to read the directions very carefully. As you're reading the directions, make sure you're using the proper stain with each organism. And then as you're drawing your pictures, make sure you're labeling like you're seeing the labels here. Now we're going to move away from eukaryotic plant cells and we are going to look at um, one example of a eukaryotic animal cell and that's going to be your human cheek cells. Now, unlike your, unlike the plant cells we looked at, animal cells lack a cell wall. Okay. Um, they are going to, in this case, we're looking at sort of epithelial cells. They have sort of a, a, a real flat appearance. And when we look at these cells, they have real irregular sort of borders. Again, I kind of like to think of them as sort of flat fried eggs is kind of how they, how, what they remind me of. When we stain these with a stain called methylene blue, again, we're going to be able to very easily see um, the nucleus. Do keep in mind that students, when they make um, the wet mount slides, each student is going to be responsible for making their own human cheek cell slide, and then that will need to be properly disposed of in regards to the biohazard bucket. So um, again, it's very important as you're going through each of these procedures to read the instructions and to follow the instructions very closely. 
When it comes to our animal cells, do make sure that you are, our cheek cells, make sure you're picking one out and you're drawing it nice and large. And again, that you're labeling um, any unique structures. In this case, the nucleus would be by far sort of the most, um, the, the, the most obvious organelle that you're seeing in regards to that cell type. Now, the last two organisms that you're going to look at are also eukaryotic cells, but these are protists. And I will tell you, okay, oftentimes students have a difficult time differentiating between eukaryotic animal cells and eukaryotic protists. So make sure that you spend some time looking at the differences between these cell types. Now, we're going to start first by looking at a eukaryotic protist, specifically the amoeba. And the amoeba actually is, is a really cool little organism. It's a single-celled organism. Um, it ultimately moves in a really cool manner called amoeboid movement, where what it does is it, the cytoplasm is sort of going to flow within the cell to, in one direction. And what's going to happen is these extensions that you're seeing here called pseudopods allow it to kind of attach and pull itself forward. So the movement that it uses is called amoeboid movement. And it actually does that movement through specific cell structures or, or cell parts that I would refer to as the pseudopod. So you can kind of see those. Um, amoeba are very, very cool. You, if we're lucky enough, we may have some live amoeba in the lab and we can take a peek at those as well. Um, I'm not going to ask, we don't ask students to identify specific organelles within the amoeba, but again, you can kind of see some of those stained organelles, uh, membrane-bound organelles that pop when we're looking at these. Finally, the last cell that students need to be to look at and familiarize themselves with uh, is the is a eukaryotic protist called a paramecium. And paramecium, again, you amoeba and paramecium, right? These are both examples of protists, um, are also single-celled organisms. Um, they have little hair-like structures called cilia that um, these little cilia are like protein filaments, and they allow for the paramecium to move very, very quickly um, through an aqueous environment by sort of um, fluctuating back and forth. So these little cilia sort of wave back and forth. And as it does that, it propels the paramecium very, very quickly through um, a sort of aqueous uh, environment. Um, again, hopefully, um, if we're in lab, we can look at some live paramecium. We often have to put them in something called protoslow that slows them down. Otherwise, they will literally sort of zip in and out of your field of view. Now again, make sure when it comes to this lab that not only can you identify each of the cells. So I should be able to say this is a paramecium. I should also be able to say that this is a protist. I should also know that it is a eukaryotic cell. I know these things a, from looking at it, and B, I know it's eukaryotic because I could actually see stained organelles. Same thing with our amoeba or our cheek cell, right? So we want to not only be able to identify, oh yes, that's a cheek cell or that's a potato cell or that's a paramecium, but we want to know, is it eukaryotic or prokaryotic? And if it's eukaryotic cell, you should be able to tell me, is it a plant, an animal, or a protist? The last thing that I will finish with is that often throughout um, the lab book, you are asked to give the approximate size of the cells. And so what this is going to do is it's going to cause you to need to look back at the microscope lab and to obtain your field of view diameter. So for example, if I know that my field of view diameter, okay, at 40x is 0.47 millimeters. And when I'm looking in through the microscope, and let's see, I, I think that I have about I have three paramecium, and, or excuse me, three amoeba. And so I kind of think I, I've got three that will fit across, right? Again, this is just an estimation. I can figure out the approximate size of each of my amoeba by taking 0.47 millimeters. Again, that was the number obtained from the microscope lab, right? When we looked and we measured our field of view and we calculated the field of views. And I can divide that by the number of cells that across my field of view. By doing that division, 
it allows me to get an approximate size of each of my cells. So in this case, we'd say it's about, you know, 0.157 millimeters, or if we converted that to micrometers, we move that decimal point three places, it would be 157 micrometers. So again, students need to be able to calculate the approximate cell size of things like the amoeba and paramecium and cheek cells. And so this is just a quick little reminder or review of how you would do that. You must go back to the microscope lab to get your approximate field of view diameter in order to be able to calculate how big approximately each of those cells are.